democratizing neurotechnology as a whole. You can look at connectivity between the brain because you had such a huge data set to, to start from. Fixing neurological disorders from Alzheimer's to alcoholism to bipolar disorder. A huge disparity in our current society that a lot of people don't really understand the technology that they use constantly. Hello, and welcome to Eden Technologies podcast. In these times of COVID, we are exercising social distancing norms and controls. <clears throat> so we are adequate distance apart. Uh, my name is Mark Malikovic. I'm an application engineer by Eden Technologies, where we develop neurotechnology devices and electrodes and applications, creating the internet of humans. And with me today, I have Abby Holland. Abby is also a test engineer by Eden Technologies. And today on this podcast, we wanted to talk a little bit about your journey coming over here. And also a lot of the interesting things going on in neurotechnology and technology development in general about the topics in diversity, uh, who's developing different technologies, what it means to have a diverse group of employees and different companies creating these technologies and what it means for the future. So, Abby, how did you come here to Switzerland and Eden Technologies? Um, so it's actually a little bit of a random whole scenario. Um, so I have been working in neurotech for uh, the past couple of years now in university. I was very involved in it and I'm just very passionate about this field in general, I'd say. Um, and after graduating university, um, I kind of ended up in a finance role and it was a little bit of a different turn. Um, and I just kind of was on the Iden website one day and um, I applied on a whim and I got it <laughs> and I just kind of took a leap of faith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it was really interesting because part of the reason I think why we're connected is also the Neurotech X community in Canada that's also expanded into Europe. Um, in Neurotech X, what do we do? Um, so Neurotech X is a not-for-profit largely focused around um, helping people get started with neurotechnologies. So whether it's playing around with neurotechnologies or expanding education into groups of people that might not uh, stumble into it themselves, um, it's really about democratizing neurotechnology as a whole. Um, and so I've been very involved with this not-for-profit for a couple of years, I'd say. Um, and you guys are too here. So I think that's a great <laughs> level uh, of connection that we had before I moved over here. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because we were you know, looking around to, for different communities because every time you're, I think, working in different technology and product spaces, it's really interesting to connect with people locally and then also globally. So in the past, I was also involved with uh, Hacking Health, which was also a Canadian organization. And then in Switzerland, I also got into neurotech partially because of brain hack and just going to hackathons and then working with brain decoding, deep neural networks, EEG. And then it's like you make all these great connections between different people and then you can really start to like build bridges and foundations for, for the future. Um, and nowadays, uh, the topics of diversity is really big in different technology centers. Uh, in startups, in big tech companies like a Google or a Facebook. And I was wondering, you know, when we talk about diversity in companies and technology products, like what does that mean for you? Um, for me, diversity throughout technology uh, specifically just means that everyone at every stage of the technology design process is represented. Mm -hmm. So that's different skin colors, it's different genders, it's different ages, it's different uh, neurodiversity backgrounds. So both mental health and physiological uh, illnesses are represented. Mm -hmm. And um, that's in the data measurement process all the way up to the end user process. So any kind of technology like this that's going to be in everyday households and is going to be used by um, people constantly, just like a smartphone is today, Mm -hmm. uh, really should be usable advantageously for every single person on this planet. And that's really what it's about to me. Yeah. And I mean, this, I think this has also permeated different sectors of the economy for, for decades or centuries. I mean, also the way that we test drugs 
I mean, I was just reading uh, about some of the latest COVID vaccines and some people are saying, oh, but it's critical that we test these on uh, people of color and different segments of society. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, isn't that <laughs> like how you would normally <laughs> test a new product <laughs> or a new medical treatment? Yeah, it's really one of those things that seems, uh, it seems obvious mm. when you're kind of looking at it from the outset. But for some reason, it just isn't obvious in our society yet. Um, like one funny example that I always like to think about is, you know that diversity is an economic benefit when Goldman Sachs makes their chair board mandatorily diverse. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like getting back to that term, when you say diverse, um, I mean, there's diversity of like features of a person, diversity of thought, diversity of like where they grew up. And like I came uh, from the United States, but I'm like my whole upper education was in Switzerland. So I'm like technically more of a Swiss engineer than, you know, an American, even though I came from the Motor City and, you know, automotive engineering in, in my background. So like if we're thinking about also designing or bringing people into teams and organizations, um, how does that idea of diversity really define like how we bring in people into those into those sectors? Yeah, I think that everyone coming from different backgrounds uh, and bringing different experiences really, really helps for the design process. I know even here, for example, I would say our team is very diverse. Um, mm -hmm. Even though it's small, I'd say we have multiple populations represented. We're from all over the world. We have multiple skin colors. We're 50-50 gender. Um, it feels very diverse. And you can even tell that and you can feel it when you're designing the product. Like when we were working on, the, uh, on our current designs, I know that we were sitting there with people from India, Canada, the United States, Germany, and Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And we crossed so many different uh, diverse check boxes, I'd say. <laughs> and you could, uh, everyone had a different uh, background and a different point of contribution to bring to the table. And I think that you can really feel that. And I think it really benefits the final product that you can produce. On the other hand, we're all basically engineers, though. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like there's diversity up to a certain, <laughs> certain point. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd also been uh, another company in the past where I was doing mechanical engineering. And I mean, we also had a lot of check boxes checked, like a guy from India, a guy from Australia who spoke German, a guy from Germany. <laughs> Actually, no real Swiss engineers in that organization. Um, and then we had... Uh, some people coming who are basically all coming from a similar university in one of the other European countries. So in a way, our culture was actually dominated, actually a bit, I would say, too much by just by one cultural look at, at the way that we were developing products. But it wasn't done, you know, I would say intentionally. It was just a natural thing to, to happen. Like if you go to a university and then you go to a company and you want to hire an intern, well, probably because you had connections at university, you might be pulling in people from that university. So I'm wondering like uh, going forward, how, like, like you say, bringing in these different perspectives is going to be important and how that can be, let's say, scaled um, while still maintaining the, the direction that we want to go. Yeah, definitely. I think that's uh, a wonderful point to bring up. And uh, definitely, like you say here, we are basically all, all engineers, which I guess makes sense for a small startup that does product design, but you're completely correct in that uh, we can't just take from that bracket because mm -hmm. all of us can use engineering specific terminology and logical processes, but that in itself is a very big limitation. Um, so I think it's really, really important to consult the end user of the product. So for us, we're really trying to bring products that can be used by everyone. So mm. we need to figure out the user requirements by talking to the people that might be using it and getting some user experience feedback from the very start. Yeah, definitely. I mean, talking to the user is like entrepreneurship 101, <laughs> startup 101. <laughs> Although I have to say, in, when you come from a technical university, you, that perspective is oftentimes lost. I think it's starting to change quite a bit because we get more like what they say, cross-pollination between business schools and engineering schools. And so the natural focus on product value can like start earlier on in the process instead of saying, hey, we have this amazing sensor we developed in the lab. Let's sell this as a product. And you're like, well, that's not a product. That's a technology component of the product experience that you could build for a customer if you understood them. Uh, so it, it seems like, you know, also when we had augmented reality coming up like a decade ago, 
was always this idea like there's this great product feature to overlay augmented experiences onto our, our real world experience. And now what are you going to use it for? And I mean, AI, I think is kind of in the same ballpark nowadays where, yeah, it's really interesting to be able to distinguish between a hot dog and a fire truck when you're looking at a piece of video. So we can classify objects, but you know, at the end, what, what are we going to be using it for? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a wonderful uh, point. And I think, yeah, I think that that's kind of where the other groups can come in, is if we as engineers mm. are able to build this uh, component that can be used as a tool, uh, other perspectives and other backgrounds and other uh, fields of interest and work can really leverage it into using it in a really wonderful application. Like I know mm -hmm. one, one uh, domain that I don't really have that much expertise in that's really popular for neuroscience is using uh, neurotechnology in artistic demonstrations. Yeah. And for me, I would have no idea how to make an art piece look wonderful, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to help provide expertise on the background of the tool. Yeah. But it's really uh, getting it into the hands in an easily usable way for other domains, I think is a really great way of kind of democratizing it all. Yeah, definitely. And also through Neurotech, I've been getting introduced to people in Barcelona who are doing architecture and neuroscience. And then I'm learning about people in Lausanne in the western part of Switzerland who are also working in this domain that actually I didn't know about before. And I had to go to uh, you know, a meetup group which was talking about, I think, so Neurotech X had a had, they had a weekend course. It was about like BCIs and game development. And it was only through some of these um through some of these meetups where I started to actually also meet some of the people in Switzerland who are working more towards the design part of a uh, neurotechnology and we're, we're, we're probably more focused on the hardware sensor design right now. And we're trying to build these bridges. Um, but it's always difficult to, to know like who to talk to because we're not all promoting our work. We're not all saying, Hey, I'm doing uh, neuro cinema. Like come talk to me about your, your product because I can use it <laughs> <laughs> because we don't even like know the capabilities that we have with, with some of these product designs. Yeah, definitely. And everything feels so experimental. Um, I also sometimes feel like there might be a gap between what people are willing to announce mm -hmm. in terms of what they're working on. Um, and the nice thing about Neurotech X, I guess, is that it gives us a, a space to announce things like that. Yeah. But it's, there's also so much going on. I mean, I check, Neurotech X probably every day and there's <laughs> there's so many new messages and yeah. people working on really interesting projects and <laughs> producing really cool new things and new domains every single day. It's really hard to keep up almost. <laughs> yeah, and also to know like where like you fit inside that community. Because uh I mean when so much cool stuff is happening, you also run the risk of getting lost in the sea of like, oh, this happened, this happened, this company just released this product. Um, but at the same time, you're, you're doing your own thing and it's also significant what you're doing, even if it, you know, you're not the person who's on social media all the time. So it's always, um, yeah, I'm really wondering where, where we're going to go over the next couple of years and how that's truly going to develop. But I think building bridges is like one of the first essential things to do to then get the product into different applications. I completely agree. And I think that COVID has actually uh, benefited neurotechnology as a general field from that really? by creating so much global conversation. Mm -hmm. um, like generally the hack nights are all in person. So the San Francisco hack night is in a singular lab in San Francisco and everyone meets up and chats in person. But now yeah. with them being online, we're able to bring in speakers from all over the world and I'm able to attend mm -hmm. while sitting in Zurich. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really interesting uh, new development and cross communication that's been enabled from that. Mm -hmm. So basically, I mean, for you personally, like what impact do you want to have in this field? Um, personally, I'm attracted to the uh, mental health potential applications. So that's fixing neurological disorders from Alzheimer's to alcoholism to bipolar disorder. I think mm -hmm. all of that is extremely interesting and is definitely heavily regulated. <laughs> um, <laughs> which may make it a little bit more challenging for something like a startup, but it's extremely interesting and it has so much potential to make a really big impact. Yeah, like scaling the the characterization of the patient journey, I think is one of the coolest things that's going to happen in neurotech over the next five years with these like everyday um, 
everyday brain activity devices that are being developed. Definitely. And even simple things like uh, the brain training wave that has come <laughs> out recently that is shown mm -hmm. to kind of decrease the long-term effects of Alzheimer's or dementia. Mm -hmm. I think something like that is going to have tremendous effects and is really going to become the norm. Yeah. And I'm excited to kind of see where all of that goes and the kind of new discoveries and mm -hmm. what that can lead to in terms of people's day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. And so what are you working on uh, as well with NeurotechX? Um, so right now I'm running the NeurotechX Sura chapter with you, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is kind of fun. Um, and then additionally, I'm running the diversity initiative. Um, so for that, our focus specifically is to try and reach out to groups of people who might not currently be exposed to neurotech in general um, and to help present them tools which they can use to become more educated and also to connect them with uh, potential mentors and mentees to help them uh, join into the field in a quicker way and therefore mm -hmm. increase the diverse representation within our field. So, I mean, like, what impact do you think that would have? Because we have... I don't know, when I, when I think about like neuroscience and neurotechnology, it's like there's these hackers who maybe are doing cool stuff with OpenBCI, flying a drone, for example. You got like hardcore researchers who are like doing MRI studies. Um, and then there's, I see this like expanding middle ground where you can build some neurotech products into experiences that can be used for things like, I think, you know, patient or treatment journeys or building connected homes and devices. And, you know, we, we've had all these issues about saying that, you know, technology is um, like racist sometimes because an algorithm was trained in a certain way. And I remember going to the Applied Machine Learning Days conference in Lausanne, and there was a researcher talking about this, like they wanted to create, you know, initiatives about more inclusivity, uh, bring people into workshops, for example, and really just... I would say opening the valve on knowledge so that you can then understand how something works and then apply it uh, in your own life. And I'm wondering like, what's the best way to, to really do that? Yeah, I really love that idea of just opening the valve and kind of having everyone learn more about it, mm -hmm. um, especially for things like day-to-day -day technologies. I think it's a huge disparity in our current society that a lot of people don't really understand the technology that they use constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, me too. I don't understand what goes on with my phone. <laughs> I, don't, I do not know how it works, but I yeah. just trust that it does. Um, but understanding technology, especially when it's directly related to your health or to your personal biometrics, is extremely important, and especially mm -hmm. when it does have inherent biases. Yeah. So something like facial recognition and the inherent biases that go along with that is a really good example of something that could happen if we fail to... Uh, open the valve, I'd say. So mm -hmm. by keeping the technology development in a small group of hands and by not testing the technology originally on more people, we're limiting our data inflow supply and mm -hmm. therefore increasing the odds of the result being biased. I mean, the data inflow is really a big topic also in the EU because there are some initiatives about... Um, basically SMEs, small businesses, developing AI products, but having access to the data. Because, I mean, depending on how you design your algorithm, you can train a very good or what we could call a bad algorithm. Um, and when we talk about diversity, it seems like just having access to data sets, which can be used for commercial purposes and not only for research purposes, but are, I think, also owned in the way that they can be added to, where we are adding classes which are more inclusive or like basically covering a spectrum of what that image means. So is it a fire truck? Is it a fire truck in uh, Paris? Is it an old style or a new style fire truck? Just as a, as a simple example. Um, because right now, a lot of these data sets like, um, you know, the faces data set, or if we're doing some multi-classification on object data sets. Uh, you, you, like you can download them, but they're essentially still controlled because they have licenses behind them. And I think we can't really have an open like type of society until we have a more open and inclusive model for how the data which goes into AI can be open to people. 
I completely agree. I think open science is a really big issue right now. It's something mm. that we need to work on improving the openness of science. Um, and just to put it in a little bit of a neuro perspective with where our conversation is at right now, um, for example, if you look at EEG, a mm. lot of EEG studies initially start out with uh, both girls and guys. Mm -hmm. And very, very regularly, the female data is just thrown out because it's, really? yeah, all the time because it's determined to be uh, not good enough data to qualify for the research. And so I was reading mm. one the other day, for example, that was, 50, that was 20 people, mm -hmm. 15 guys and five girls, and all of the data sets from the five girls were just removed from the analysis because they just didn't get good signal. And so something like that is problematic to me, which is rather than diving in and figuring out if maybe it's a different signal is represented in female brains mm. or why is the data bad for girls, they're instead just removing the data. And this kind of issue would also become uh, better organized and better manipulated in the long term if all of this data was stored collectively. So rather than the female data being thrown out every mm -hmm. single time or having these five uh, girls removed every time, yeah. instead they're added to a da database. And then you can analyze the patterns of 500 females and say, oh, even though that's not produced here, Something mm -hmm. else is actually produced from that same input. Mm -hmm. And so having a bigger data set and having more open communication like that would actually probably allow us to come to some really interesting research uh, endpoints that we won't otherwise be able to reach. Mm. I mean, the, what I'm hoping is also we'll just have larger study populations to begin with because EEG, although there's like great advancements in signal processing, like the ability to scale a study with EEG and brain activity, especially if you're using wet electrodes, is, I mean, it's difficult. It's just hard to do. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Even, even for us the other day when we were talking about uh, applying for ethical, applying for uh, ethical confirmation. Yes, thank you. <laughs> ethical approval uh, for a thesis of one mm -hmm. of our coworkers. Um, we asked initially for 25 subjects because we all thought, oh, to test this product, we're going to need hundreds of people. Yeah. 25 subjects on an ethical approval is like baby food. That seems like, <laughs> that seems like the obvious lowest number we could choose. Yeah. And we got denied for having too many people. Mm. And they asked us to reduce the number of people. Yeah. And even something like that um, kind of is crazy to me. How does that meet the law of large numbers? How am I supposed to draw a result from only six people using brain activity. Yeah. And, and I mean, and we also have a lot of studies that have been published also with MRI in the past where, you know, it might be a functional MRI study where a person is doing something, then you see an activity in the brain region, and then you draw a conclusion about what this means for the overall structure of the brain as applied to the general population. And then you find out that they used, uh, yeah, like six or 12 people which makes sense when you see how complicated it can be to do an MRI study. But still, is if we just have a lot of small studies and we can't you know, bring the data together in, in, a, in an open way, I think it's going to be very difficult because then the only studies which are really ever going to mean anything are the ones that are like the connectome study, for example, that, that had finished up recently. Like it's great. You can look at connectivity between the brain because you had such a huge data set to, to start from. And I mean, you can get access to that data as well. It's just not necessarily so straightforward. Yeah, a hundred percent. And also, um, it's challenging when you consider the universities that are funded well enough mm -hmm. to run things like these ten-person studies. Yeah. Um, their likelihood of population is going to be uh, relevant to their university more than other things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's whoever is living in the area. Exactly. <laughs> which exactly. makes sense. <laughs> and so if you think about something like an FNIR system, yeah. which uh, requires a different skin, a skin value, because mm -hmm. each reflectance of your skin has a different exact value associated. What, what, what's FNIRs again for people who don't know Oh, it? sorry. Uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy. Yeah. So they shine a laser through your skin and then measure your blood oxygenation value from that. So, and then the, the blood oxygenation is connected to like how functional the brain is supposed to be in that region. Exactly. So it's brain activation levels. Yeah. So if a specific section of your brain has a lot of oxygenated blood, 
you can assume that that area of your brain is working really hard. Yeah. And so in order to measure those specific metrics, you need to shine the laser through someone's skin. But my skin value for a laser will have a different value than someone of a different skin color because mm -hmm. the laser needs to in interact with your skin differently. So if all the studies are being conducted on white guys, which is the historical fact, <laughs> how are we going to measure a black female? And I think also the, like the Apple Watch uh, had this issue as well. If your hand is, well, not just the Apple Watch, but any sort of sensor which is using, well, the same thing, like light reflectance to measure pulse. If your hair skin is too hairy or tattooed, then that can also create problems. Yeah, definitely. So with all these different variables, um, and there's so many different variables in <laughs> personal biometrics, how are you able to take a small data set and say that that describes a full population? And even more than that, if you have every, if you have the top 20 universities each conduct the same experiment, but only on their populations, and the those populations aren't representing the actual population of the world, you also can't just extrapolate that out to being representative. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that we're conducting larger scale studies that actually can incorporate the different diverse groups. Like even, like you were saying, hairy versus not hairy. <laughs> if you only have six people and that's a major factor, you're either going to shave them or you're going to look for people that aren't that hairy because you're not going to waste one of your six people on someone you can't get good data from. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, also, I mean, coming back to something like COVID and vaccines, like the whole study design and having tools to improve the study design so you have a better distribution um, of patients, like to begin with, that, that's really important. I mean, because actually when I, was, when I was first learning about AI, like I started to get into deep learning neural networks through Udacity. Um, but in the more recent courses I've been doing, like around AI and medicine, you know, as opposed to first jumping into just the, the characterization of, of x-ray images, for example, the first thing you do is look at the, the patient characteristics of those scans. So you would say, you know, what's the distribution of male versus female? What's the distribution of com comorbidity of the diseases that these people have been diagnosed with at the time of the study? And then you say, ah, is there like a bell curve? Is this an equal distribution or is it too skewed? And like right there used to, because if you then build your algorithm off of a skewed um, patient population, then the result is going to be skewed. Then you might have an AI which can detect pneumonia for um, a white male of 25 to 35 years old, but maybe fail on a, a woman who's 65 to 70 years old. And uh, that, that's definitely one of the things that gets lost, I would say, whenever, whenever we talk about, you know, news stories about AI doing this or doing that. It's always a question of like, where, where does, what's the foundation for, for, what, for what this model is built on? Yeah. And I would even, I would even like to point out that uh, the, there's a whole other factor of even just what country you're from. Mm -hmm. So I know I was talking with one of our Indian coworkers the other day about um, vitamin D production. Uh-huh that's related to your historical background, which okay. is very, very odd. Um, but it makes sense biologically and evolutionarily. Mm -hmm. And so if you're trying to test these things only on people in North America, for example, or in Europe, and then you try and bring that product to Africa, and it's something like a medical device, yeah. are you properly considering, even aside from race, are you properly considering the potential effects that uh, being from that geo geographical area may have had? Mm -hmm. And are we properly thinking through all of those different aspects and accounting for every single one of those variables. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many it's, questions and not enough answers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it feels like a very large problem when you step back and, and consider it. What are the next steps you see for yourself? Um, so yeah, I guess one of them would be to just try to find a couple solutions to these problems or these major variables, I guess. Um, and for me, I think the biggest way of approaching that will just to be large scale data analysis. So uh, if we could, for example, develop a product that's usable by everyone and it's part of their day to day lives, mm -hmm. that data analysis could have a really positive effect on how much we know. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, if we could get 
a million minutes of your data. Whoa. <laughs> A million minutes of uh, EEG data collected at the air. <laughs> I mean, these are long-term ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if we could get a million minutes, yeah. and we have uh, we have an option for users to provide us very, very basic information, such as gender, origin, country, um, maybe race, maybe generalized lifestyle habits, such as are you completely sedentary or do you like to work out? Mm -hmm. very, very basic questions. Um, we could actually probably investigate a lot more about a lot of these variables mm -hmm. and just create devices that are significantly more useful and even have significantly more medical applications. Like when we talk about emotion specifically, if you could quantify your emotion, <laughs> for example, in the US, you wouldn't be able to be denied insurance money for being depressed. Mm -hmm. Think about the difference that would make. Yeah, I mean, that would be huge. Um, and, and, and like when we talk about emotion, especially, I, I just thought about this because when I mean, you can quantify emotion through machine vision, right? You, 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 of course, you come back, you take your data set, and you say there's people who are happy or they're sad or they're inattentive. And then you assign these emotional characteristics to those images as classes, and then you train your algorithm. But then I remember the thinking that um, I think in Russia, it's usually not socially acceptable to show a lot of emotion. Um, and I, 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 I'm also thinking back to the pictures of my uh, grandparents who are coming from Eastern Europe, where you know they would never smile because that was not socially acceptable to, to show your emotions in that way at that point in time. And so even the way that we're displaying emotions uh, visually, you know, it changes generation to generation. So if we train an algorithm now to say if you're happy or sad based on what you look like, this is probably not even going to be valid in um, 15, maybe 20 years. It might, even, it might be completely different. We might have like, the pendulum might have been swinging all the way back to having uh, a more reserved uh, look to yourself. Uh, and of course, that would then... Yeah, it changed throughout the entire world, so. Yeah, that's a really good way of describing kind of the uncertainty of the current systems, I guess. Yeah, because right now it's basically train and deploy. And I think it really has to be train and optimize for different people, like optimize for your personal states or the personal way in which you live and exist in the world. Because um, otherwise we'll never get to like a really, to an AI which is really growing with us and evolving with us. Yeah, definitely. It really feels um, that right right now as a society, we're measuring symptom mm -hmm. and trying to use that as our main indicator. But I think that it's really about changing the lens of focus and really looking at the cause mm -hmm. and trying to identify at the base root what is going on and not just matching this person has this symptom or this result. And that's what we're going to look at, but just looking way past that and saying, okay, this is the starting point. How can we gain metrics from the starting point instead of the final result? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, that blows my mind. Oh, we have a lot of cool things to work on. <laughs> a lot of more conversations like this to have, I guess. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and having conversations is, I think, like a big part of this, either with Neurotech X or if you're on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, we tweet about some of these topics as well. Uh, but I think we, we try to be also open as an organization to bring in different voices and to build these bridges and to hear different perspectives from people. So if you're interested in getting in touch, uh, let us know. We'd love to extend conversations about neurotechnology and the, the future of society with you. Abby, do you have any uh, last thoughts? No, I think this was a really interesting conversation. And uh, I echo that I hope we hear from some other voices and mm -hmm. can bring in some other opinions. Cool. So thank you very much for joining us again in uh, the EDA and Technologies offices in Afikon in Switzerland. And we look forward to coming back to you with the next uh, podcast in about a month. So, tschüss. Bis später.